Welcome to the last block of the day. Hooray. It's the best talk of the day, I'm sure. Yes. And so my young co-workers are working on a very important project at uh, Red Hat. I'm sure they're going to be very enthusiastic, more enthusiastic than me. <laughs> share all the information about uh, what we're doing to uh, bring the world of continuous integration into the world of the kernel at Red Hat. I hope you're all ready for some exciting fun. <laughs> I don't know if there's really cookies or not. But if not, it's their fault. I mean, there's no cookies. <laughs> so next, Baraka. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about um, how we introduce CI into the kernel development at Red Hat and how we hope to bring it upstream, uh, how we're doing it and how we think it could, could cooperate with others. Uh, but first, is there anybody who doesn't like cookies? <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. <laughs> we're all set. I don't like problems. <laughs> um, nobody likes those. We're not talking about those. Uh, so, okay, hi, I'm Veronica. You might know me from some of the mailing lists when I'm usually over generic annoyance. Uh, I'm also an organizer of uh, Czech Python conference and a Vanabi mentor. And I'm Nikolai Kondrashov. I'm an engineer at Red Hat, obviously. Uh, I'm also an uh, electronics embedded enthusiast and I also maintain Digiment project where I work on drivers for graphics tablets. And I do stuff like, uh, I know, USB heat dump and heat RD convert, like for the for the HID devices, but that's uh, that's outside work. So and uh, we are a part of the um, CKI team that is just pronounced Cookie, or well, supposed to be pronounced Cookie, and we are spread over the world and different places, and a bit kind of a collection of people from different teams at Red Hat trying to push this forward. And I want to start with the fact that n not too long ago, uh, kernel release testing at Red Hat was kind of archaic and, well, and, and it, uh, to find bugs, it took a lot of effort from everybody involved as well as time. And uh, it, it looked kind of like this, a little bit. So the developers usually threw the built over the wall and then the testers played with it and then threw it over the wall again until, until they couldn't and then a release happened. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was of course inefficient in uh, collaboration communication standpoint and took a while but the, the worst thing was that our tests were running at the end of our the great code, code pipeline that exists both inside and outside Red Hat. That means that as bugs progress down, down the pipeline, the further they go, uh, the, uh, the longer it takes for them to fix, to, be, to get fixed as you, can, as you need to go back and, um, and communicate the bug and have the fix accepted and then wait for the code to percolate downstream all the time. And the final few bugs, which were actually hit by our, by our tests, took the longest to fix. And uh, so we decided to improve that situation, of course, and uh, we need to do it much earlier, but we did it anyway. And uh, right now we have automatic tests running uh, for, the, for the kernel repos that we have inside Red Hat for the, the ones that go into release and in the, in the, in the, into the uh, distribution. And we have uh, tests running on the contributions that go into mail lists uh, as soon as they get posted on the mail list. But we thought we could bring it also to upstream to join the others uh, who already sent in their reports, Intel and, uh, and Naro, and maybe take it a little further. So we want those tests to run, obviously, on Linux tree, and uh, we want it to run on sub specific subsystem trees, and finally, we want them to run on the contributions that go into subsystem mail lists before maintainer, maintainers even set their eyes on it. We want the tests to run fast, we want to run the tests to provide results fast, and um, we want to shorten the feedback loop as much as possible so that the fa bugs are found faster, sooner, and fixed, and so that ultimately uh, real quality increases. 
So why, why we think that could be useful for other people, not only to us, is because we have tons of hardware starting with x86 and uh, the whole zoo of AR64 and then PPC64, PPC64 LE and finally be, be difficult to obtain as 390X and we have machines to start in the VMs obviously and down to laptops, PCs, servers, mainframes, all kinds of stuff. We have this in, in our labs and available for testing on. As well we have uh, various kinds of peripherals and hardware like GPUs and NICs and uh, all kinds of stuff that we can target. Uh, they are all part of a single system at Red Hat which maintains the inventory and provides the way to, to reserve this, this hardware and to run tests on and to, to provision the stuff. Uh, we have a lot of tests both, we run a lot of tests both from the upstream and uh, developed intern internally and this is just a few of them and what's more important is that behind each of these we have maintainers, specific people who are responsible for the test to work and you can see like names repeated because obviously some people maintain a few more tests than one and uh, that, that allows us to keep them working and we keep, keep them on track and uh, always sync up as developers and uh, work on the issues if, as they arise inevitably and uh, we already work with uh, a stable Linux uh, the stable tree the stable RC tree and the um, stable Q which Greg works on, where he keeps his patches to be incorporated into the stable releases. And here's an example of report of the report that which we sent to um, a stable mail list. And starting with, uh, with the obviously the overview, this, this test passed, and uh, this is the kernel repo which was used with the commit and the um, the artifacts that we produced. Finally, we we go to um, we make commands that we use to build it. Here's the, here's the images and the configs that were produced. Then we follow with the summary of the tests for each of the architectures and the hosts. So like they can be, right now there are two hosts for each architecture for each run and all the tests. Some tests are waived, means that uh, they don't affect the result of the, of, the, um, of the total summary of the test and like for the test that we are just introducing or fixing. Uh, yeah, we have the comment on that on the message and the second host of the same ar architecture then the PPC64, both hosts, x86, both hosts and at the end we have the links to the, um, to the tests which we uh, store in the, in the same uh, repo on GitHub right, that right now and it allows us to have tight control on what exactly we execute to apply fixes quicker and to respond to the changes in the kernel faster and to isolate us from some developments that can interfere with the specific versions that we are testing. Uh, if we go further into the logs that we post, uh, we have them organized by the architecture host and the specific test and each test can have multiple logs. And if you take the example of this uh, stable queue report, uh, we can see that how, the, how they would work. So this, this, uh, this run failed and we uh, immediately we send the copy of this report to test maintainers uh, who will be able to step in and uh, comment on the failure if something goes wrong, if it's, it's a false positive and take action if something's broken. Uh, this, in this case the test failed, yet not a merge or compile and this is the specific test that failed uh, and this is the summary of what we actually tested, the, uh, the repository for the, from the, the stable tree, the commit exact exactly and then the commit from the Q3 and the patches that were in that Q3 and finally we can see the test that failed and if we go to the blogs we can find the PPC64 LE first host and these are the logs for this test and in this case the problem was in this file and uh, we can find it and uh, point out that this particular test failed and finally this was actually a false positive and our maintainer stepped in and responded what the problem was and uh, when he's going to fix it. So as we stated at the beginning, the tests were only run for kernel builds. Now the rate at which we are running the test is much higher. The tests are running for every post posted patch internally and for various upstream kernels as well. That means that it's much easier to discover bugs also in the test. There are software, there are corner cases, 
in the case which we could have seen right now, uh, the issue was that uh, a test wasn't ready to run on that kind of the machine. So let's talk a bit about more current uh, test bugs that we discovered. Um, LTP is the most widely used and most comprehensive kernel test suite. And uh, it contains a very large number of tests for subsystems and CVs. They do releases twice a year. And uh, sometimes we can find issues in those releases as well. But right now, a few weeks ago, we started more closely collaborating with the LTP upstream maintainers. We started using uh, more new commits from the master directly to not only find bugs in the kernel, but also in the LTP test suite as well, and to basically make the, make the test suite more stable faster. These are just some examples of the bugs that we were able to find in the LTP test suite. And migrating to using newer commits helped us to find some other possible kernel issues. These are not yet debugged. Let's keep it with LTP, but uh, talk about bugs that were actually verified and already fixed in the upstream kernels. This is a kernel bug that was discovered uh, by the migrate pages test. You can see the email to the upstream mailing list from one of the LTP test maintainers who stepped in and debugged the failure and found, found the issue. Here you can see the patch that resolved that failure in the upstream tree. Here is another example of LTP test, this case mtest06, which started hanging. I think it was on kernels like 420 and higher. And this happens on ARM, actually. You can again find here the commit that fixed the issue. Let's keep it with the mtest06, which is like a very nice test finding a lot of issues. Here is another issue, which was again on ARM, very hard to reproduce and debug. And I want to point out this reply on the mailing list. Maybe we should be doing more testing on ARM and PPC. And this is what Nick talked about at the beginning when he showed all the hardware that we are doing the testing on. Actually, most of the bugs that we found were on non-x86 architectures. This is another test we are running, KVM unit test. It's finding some bugs as well in the upstream kernel. Again, this happened on ARM. Here was an issue with the timer. Block tests are another larger test suite that we're running. This bug happened also on ARM. And another issue this time on the x86, actually. Uh, there was a page fault trace call. Again, already resolved upstream, of course. And by testing kernel, we actually don't only find bugs in the kernel itself, but also in packages that depend on kernel. In this case, uh, there was a bug in Zippo, which is S390 bootloader. We worked with uh, the bootloader team to resolve the problem. Since we started talking about the stable reports, we are actually faster than the stable build systems. <laughs> and find things not only what are bugs in kernel, but bugs in the patches, how the patches are posted. This one was a really fun one. Slower. It's slower. You, should like read them. You, you don't need to read them. <laughs> 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 yeah, this, this one was a fun one because it uh, was discovered like around the time we started sending these table reports, all of the boot testing failed. We hit a kernel panic on all architectures. 
and it was <laughs> actually a test for CI that was pushed into the stable repositories to test the CI systems testing the kernel. We were so happy we found this one. <laughs> yeah, this one was really funny. <laughs> oh, since we would be here for a very long time if we were talking in detail about all the bugs that we found, uh, we set up a tracker in the linked uh, Git repository where you can find all the upstream bugs uh, that have a public bug tracker <coughs> or resolution on the mailing list on this link so we can save them some time. And before we move forward, I want to thank to every developer and test maintainer that is helping us uh, resolve the issues and debug them because without you, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we are doing. Yeah, this, this is the kind of work that goes like that goes across the departments at Red Hat and across the uh, all kinds of people involved with this, of course. And uh, we're not using that back tracker to track the issues, of course, at Red Hat is just uh, for the outside, but a lot of bugs that we find, of course, stay inside Red Hat because they like, can be in, in stable kernels and things like that, and this is, this is just for the publishing. Yeah, so let's talk about the actual CK implementation for a second. Um, the kernel development is a bit different than a development of random user space projects that are on GitHub, as we all know probably. Uh, we are using uh, GitLab CI and we are hacking around it a bit to make it do what we want it to do. Let's just start with the triggers. We need to figure out how to actually test things and what to test. Um, the basic one is a git trigger. We need to figure out when there was a new commit to the git tree. We clone that tree, build it, test it. Um, the other ones of the simple triggers are for Fedora build systems. We are testing Fedora kernel builds from Brew of Koji and Copper. And probably the most advanced trigger we have is for patches. Parsing all the emails from mailing list is, <laughs> as we probably all know, a lot of pain. So we are using patchwork for, for this, so we don't need to reinvent all the work patchwork is already doing. Uh, it's a management tool to make it easier to track the patches on the mailing list. Um, we just query the patchwork API and grab new patches, apply them to the tree, build it, test it. The other triggers you can see here are for GitHub and GitLab. These are actually for testing our tests with known stable kernels and to test our pipeline as well. Then lower down in the diagram you can see all our stages. The lint one is for checking the patches. Uh, for example, with the check patch PL script, we are only using this one internally right now, but there's no reason why it couldn't be extended to upstream once we start testing patches upstream as well. The merge stage serves for either just cloning the Git tree or also applying the patches in case patches are being tested. Then we obviously build a kernel, publish it so people from upstream can download the binary directly and get the kernel we actually tested. The test stage follows. We are doing the testing in Beaker, which contains all those machines Nick talked about. And then there is a review stage, which is showed in the dotted lines because we are getting rid of it. It basically just slows down getting the report out to developers and we are CCing the test maintainers on the reports anyways. So there's no need to wait and uh, make it slower. So all the emails that are going to upstream are fully automated, there is no review stage. Then all of this is put together in the email reports, which you've already seen some examples of. 
Now let's see how the full GitLab CI pipeline looks. You can see that it's pretty large. This one actually contains also the review stage, so you can see how it all looks. It all starts with linting, merging, and then it branches out to all the targets that we want to test. In these cases, there are different architectures, but we can add targets, for example, for debug kernels as well. Then we publish the kernels, test them, and the review stage here uh, is a manual step. That's why it's shown at the start of the pipeline. That's just a GitLab CI thing, where if uh, the developer or person from QE reviews the report and determines if it's a real failure or not, they can click the particular button and send the report or make sure it doesn't get sent. As I mentioned, we are trying to get rid of this stage and it's not used for upstream. So let's look in details about the actual triggers. For the Git repo, um, Git doesn't really send you notifications when there are new commits. So we need to pull the repo in regular intervals and we check if we've already seen that particular commit. If not, then we clone the repo, build and test it. For the patchwork, the part with cloning the repo is same, but we are pulling the patchwork API and uh, getting new patch series from there, and then we are testing each patch series separately. We apply the patches and build and test them. Um, so I have a question. You said if it sees the git commit, then if it's seen it before, it doesn't do anything? No. What, what happens if you're watching a tree and you wanted to watch multiple branches oh, and you it's merge one branch up to another one? It won't do it again, will it? I mean, if, does it keep record of the hashes? It keeps a record of the hashes, but uh, it's watching the branches and trees separately. Okay. All right, I, I, the reason I ask is because we, at least for my tree, we start off putting commits in one branch. When we decide they're done and baked, we move them over to another branch. It's really just, it doesn't need to be tested again. They, they go over exactly the same, so. Okay. Yeah, we, we watch the trees and we watch the branches and then check if in our history of commits, there is already a hash of that commit present. Yeah, so the stable queue development is a bit special. It's not like patches sent to the patchwork or just pushed. Uh, they are using quilt-like series in a separate Git repository. So we have to actually check both this repository and the base repo where to apply the patches and match them together. Uh, there are still some quirks which we are trying to figure out and some, some details as always. Um, but this is also a very specific workflow that we are trying to handle and as you saw, we actually found some issues with, with these repositories as well. The Koji and Copper triggers are very simple because we don't need to actually build a kernel. The Fedora build systems are doing this for us. We only pull the new builds for the kernels that we are interested in and test them. You can see some logs from the trigger. Um, the build systems are using a messaging system, so we have a listener deployed. You can see here the logs for a non-kernel build that completed, and yeah, we have a lot of debug logs here, so you can see that the pipeline wasn't triggered for this particular build. Here you can see a build that failed from, from Copper, so it, this is, again, not a build we are interested in. And here you can actually see a build for Fedora 30, which we are interested in and which we are testing and a pipeline was triggered for this particular build. So now just a few words about our CI setup. 
um, we have a bot that we ask to test because we need to test the changes with known good kernels so we know that nothing broke. The full pipelines are being executed just with the changes that, that we push to the pipeline. And uh, the interesting part here is also that uh, our code is fully upstream and public, uh, but the beaker that uh, the testing happens in runs internally. So we actually need to trigger all this pipeline internally and that adds some additional complexity that we need to handle in this trigger, which is the exactly the fun part. Now I handle it to, to Nick to talk yes. about some more details. Thank you. Uh, so since th this particular way we trigger um, the pipelines is very curious because GitLab CI is, is, do is done for repos obviously stored in GitLab and we don't store kernel in GitLab, none of it is in GitLab. So we have to trick GitLab CI to start picking up it, our jobs. So we do it by making empty commits to a special Git repo and then triggering the CI on those commits and uh, supplying the parameters of the kernel to be tested. With, that, with, that, with those um, jobs. So it goes like this, for example, if baseline trigger detected some, some commits in some repos, it submits one, one commit to one branch and another commit to another branch, and we have separate branches for separate kernel trees. Uh, stable, stable queue detected another one, submits to stable branch again, because we're still testing stable. And uh, the patchwork detected some patches being posted to the mail list for L7, we submitted to L7 branch. And the GitHub bot came in and detected some merge request somewhere in GitLab or GitHub, and uh, was asked to test. And then it submits like a bunch of jobs to, set to, to multiple branches with, to test for multiple Git trees to test our own changes to, to our own pipeline. This repo is uh, private because we test some some commits that are private to Red Hat, uh, and uh, it could the, as a result the commits can look like this like the, the branches, there's a bunch of empty commits being created there on which the, at which the uh, CI pipeline was started and you can see the status of those pipelines to the right, like some fail, some passed, some are still being executed. And specific commits have commit messages explaining what kind of parameters went in there and uh, you can go through those through those commits in the, in, the, in the repository and see which exact parameters went into this specific run and uh, they specify things like the Git repo, the URL, the uh, hashes, the um, where to send the reports, and which branch was there, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So baseline is, is the simplest, and the uh, stable is more complicated to fit here. And you can see like the, which commit of the, uh, of the stable tree was used, and which commit of the queue tree was used. And this way, since this, this is all stored, in the in the parameters, we can retrigger the same commit for the same with the same job run for the same the same commit for the same state of both trees, and the the patch commit obviously refers back to the uh, to the specific patches in the, in patchwork, and specific uh, for example the the specific subject that was used and where to send the emails etc. So this all carries on to the to the uh, pipeline. Uh, and the retriggers, for example, when we test a specific parts of the pipeline, we don't need to merge and build the kernel again. We just use the images that we built previously for the for another run that turned out to be good. We just point to them, like you can see at the bottom, we're pointing specifically to artifacts that we built before, and we can run our uh, test on our own pipeline with those artifacts, so it goes faster. And the same here, for, for, every, for every branch it's the same. Uh, and uh, since, uh, well, we need to change our pipeline and uh, if, we, if we do it in the same repo as the, those triggers submit to it would be unusable. We have a separate repo which actually contains our pipeline code and if anybody knows how GitLab CI works, so there is a, there is a file in the repo uh, which describes the pipeline. Can I ask a question, Nikolai? Yeah. <coughs> so based on how you set up the YAML files here and the triggering here, it seemed like it's pretty easy to plug in any subsystem or Git tree in here to trigger testing, is that right? Yes, yes, absolutely right. Thank you. So uh, anybody who wants to plug in the CKI just can probably, what, send an email to CKI project? 
submit a pull request to the pipeline dash data repository with a link to your Git tree. If you have issues with the parameters, we can help you out with that. Um, so, your stuff is built on top of Beaker, right? So, how do you add hardware, or how do you run this in your own lab if you're not using Beaker? Or yeah, that's the, that's the point. That's <laughs> the point. We get to this. We get to this. This is a good question. Uh, so, so, are you going to talk about it? I had a similar question, so I'll wait. Yeah, we're going to talk about it. Okay. Another question? So you, you use your own trigger for builds and you use your own tests, you use your own machine pools. So what parts of the GitLab are you using? The, we use the GitLab CI to maintain the, the connection between the jobs that we run inside the CI. Like we connect like, okay, we merge this, then we build it, then we test it, then we send the reports, kind of binds all the stages together and allows us to monitor it, to see the logs, how it's happening, to restart it to keep the track, like uh, the history of the jobs that we ran, things like that. But so this day it does the same thing as <coughs> Jenkins would do, if you know what Jenkins is. No, I don't, but I'm trying to understand how much work are you, how much of the functionality you're actually reusing from? From GitLab. GitLab, yes. GitLab, GitLab allows you a lot of customizations for the CI. You basically just write bash commands, for example, or execute any other language you want. So we just tell GitLab CI to build the kernel or to merge patches or to send a job to Beaker. So we are basically using the whole pipeline and CI ecosystem from GitLab. And that's the part that's interacting with, for example, the Git trees and Beaker. If that makes sense. You don't store the Git tree as this. You mean, you said you, you do an empty commit so the kernel is actually not managed there's by GitLab. Basically, there is a job there if we go, uh, well, that's gonna be a long way. Uh, there, is a, there is a job that says clone.repo, check out this commit, like it's basically bash script, you can say. Clone the tree, check out the commit, uh, merge the patches, build the kernel. Like it's another job is, uh, is build, the, build the kernel and put the artifacts up there and the next job says, okay, pull, pull point at that kernel, tell Beaker to start testing from that kernel that is stored there. And this is CI, is, the GitLab CI is basically orchestrating and linking all those stages together. Let's us see the overview to restart particular job in the pipeline and things like that. So to trick, the, to trick GitLab CI, we, we use two repos where we keep, in one repo we keep the actual code for the pipeline, the bash scripts and the YAML files, and the other one is just the very minimal stuff that includes those, like the RHEL 7 includes the RHEL 7 specific stuff and the common pipeline and RHEL 8 does the same and stable and so on. So further on for the testing, we don't have much time left. Uh, we have this basic data flow. We have the, the test database, which is uh, at the moment private because we have a mix of upstream and uh, downstream stuff there and some things like what goes into RHEL 7 and RHEL 8 and uh, which is secret, but we have a plan to separate the private parts and the public parts and publish the, the parts that are public so that we can, we can work with people on that. Then we have the tool which goes and uh, transforms that database according to, takes, takes parts, pieces about tests and according to parameters uh, like which kernel to test and which tests to run it creates a special XML file which we can feed to Beaker and uh, which tells exactly where to pull everything and which tests to run and how, et cetera. And Beaker is uh, the system that was developed at Red Hat and was actually started by kernel developers. And it's open source, it's at uh, beakerproject.org, but the problem with it is that nobody can set it up. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, we tried. And uh, that's, that's the big problem as that was hinted at. And uh, another problem is that even if it was open system, the thing is that what matters in this case is the hardware that we have. It would be good that somebody could install Beaker and actually start running our CI somewhere if they want to work on it or if they want to bring it up themselves. And 
maybe that will happen and make, maybe it will be um, easier because people are working on improving Beaker. Or maybe we'll implement support for some other system, which is also in the plans. Uh, so test databases uh, contains the uh, information on which architectures we, we are able to test, uh, which host types are available. We have the Beaker system allows you to specify very precisely which host you want, which parameters, like how much RAM, how much disk space, what kind of disk, what kind of hardware, special like interface cards or whatever. But since this is too, too uh, specific and uh, too fine-grained, we have our own special host types, like we want to run specific tests on bare metal, or we want this, this test to run with mega RAID cards, or we want the RDMA hardware or stuff like that. Then, of course, there are the multiple trees, various kinds like uh, real-time kernel or upstream this or upstream that or all kinds which can be different, like split for different purposes. For some tests, we will run for L7, some for rel 8 for some, some are, can run for upstream. Finally, there, but not finally, fi then there are the components of the build that we are testing because we might need to test the upstream kernel, which in our pipeline produces only only the kernel image for, or we can test something that was submitted to to our build system which produces the kernel, the headers, uh, the internal headers, the user space headers, the, uh, the debug information and depending on the on the components that we get we can choose to run specific tests like which which might need the debugging for this specific test or something or, or need to build some some module for, which needs the kernel kernel headers and things like that. So we need to branch on that. Finally, we of course have the test sets. For example, we need to run the network tests on this build or the developer requests the network, makes a build and says like, okay, run the network test. And this is how we specify which tests uh, concern network. Finally, we have the suite information, the suite information. And uh, there are like about 75 test suites which, which are run for upstream right now. And some of them are very small. And some of them are like LTP Lite or, or USIX or KVM tests. And uh, an example of uh, sweet data, it's, this is uh, not being run at for upstream right now, but it's, it's the test that you can run yourself, so it, it will probably be run by for upstream soon. So, of course, they start with the test name, then there's the location in the GitHub repo that I showed you before. In this case here, there is the uh, host type that we want to use and the, uh, the additional requirements for the host that the test might need, and this is in a special beaker language that you can look like this, like, okay, I don't want to run on Mustang or HP Moonshot because I don't work there. Uh, then there's, of course, the maintainers, which we need to contact if anything happens, and then there's the sometimes big patterns which describe where a test has, has to run, like, for example, which, the, which, which sets it belongs to, which, and this is uh, actually a nice feature. Uh, this specifies when the test should run, if, if we are running for a patch, and that this specifies the specific files that need to be changed for this test to run. So for example, if we, if we change something that's not related to KVM, we don't run this test. And if it's a KVM change, then we run this test based on this regexpos uh, for the source files. Then the um, actual architectures, of course, that we run on, and the, um, and the trees that we run on. Finally, you can specify multiple uh, uh, instances of this test suite which can differ by parameters, for example, and here's an example of one. Uh, this, this has two instances and they differ by their environment variables and also there's one thing, this is how you specify uh, whether the test is waived or not, like do we take, the, take it seriously or is it not ready yet? And uh, I'm sorry? How do you determine weighed? Who f uh, where does that data come from so and how do you feed it in? Thank you. At, uh, at the moment, this is, this is manual that we decide ourselves based on how, trust, how trustworthy the test is and how much we tested it. So when the test is weighed, it is, it is executed with normal jobs, like with upstream even, but we, don't, we, we ignore the test. We show the results, but they say like it's ignored. That, has, that lets us to test, uh, test the test in the, in the battle situations. Ideally, we would like to have the statistics and we are working on that and determine like if this test ran by itself. But this is very difficult to achieve because this depends on the complexity of the test. Like I want to run this big test longer and this short test short, like less time. And uh, there are many variables and the manual way is the most, is the best. Yes. So going back to your 
thing on the, the source code that you have reference. So is that used uh, by your system today to skip patches that don't touch certain areas of the kernel? Yes. Okay. But this is, this is only happening when, the, when we test patches, when we, when we test the baselines and like repeatedly the Git repo, they, when they run everything. Okay, so here's an example of, of using that particular feature. So if, if we don't specify the test, the patch, then uh, it produces this many tests for upstream. And if we specify the patch, it produces this many tests for upstream. And another, the specific job that is generating the XML, we can say like generate the XML, this is the kernel, this is the tree, and this is the architecture, and this is the patch. And uh, it will out start out with you know, like lots and lots of stuff like this. And if you take a look at the record for a test, there's the test name and uh, the Git repo and the, the saved status and the maintainers and the, uh, for example, the maximum time that this test is allowed to run. And this is the how it would look in Beaker, the submitted jobs for specific, like this is separate for, for our, per architecture and inside there can be ma multiple hosts for each job and there's the, and this is the, uh, how a specific host run would look like and the test and the results in that system and the, the, which you can inspect there. But this is of course available only internally at the moment. So uh, the part of report about reporting is, uh, oh, it was very short. So we, uh, as we proceed through the pipeline, each stage generates a bunch of artifacts like the log files and the state of that stage, the results like this is succeeded or not and this is the additional results. And as each job completes, it uh, triggers a webhook for our report process, which the report process ignores uh, until we get to the end of the pipeline when it starts putting together the report and it takes the inform some information from the first stages and puts it in the summary and then it takes the further information like the maintainers that we put in there and the, whether it's saved or not and puts it to the test summary and it's the overall summary and sends it off. Okay, so we've been here for the first day of plumbers and during the distribution microconference, uh, there was a lot of people saying they are dealing with a lot of similar problems as we are. So we realized this also before and that's why we want to collaborate with other CI systems for the upstream. Um, with the kernel maintainers, uh, we can test your tree. We already talked about this. Uh, with the test maintainers, we can run your tests and actually like test your tests as well. And uh, for the other CI systems, um, there's a lot of stuff that we can collaborate on and join our efforts because everybody is dealing with the same problems, how to test things, what tests to run, what hardware to run the tests, and uh, everybody is basically re-implementing the same thing all over again. And this is why we're organizing a Hackfest right after Plumbers uh, this Thursday and Friday. Um, this is a very rough agenda. Uh, I'll skip to the last slide we have here uh, because it has a link to our uh, blog where you can find all the information. Uh, we are really looking forward to figuring out some common themes and actually creating some action items and uh, then starting working on this so we don't need to re-implement all of the work all over again. Yeah, we have a few places left, right? Yeah, we have approximately about five spots. So if you want so to So if come. everybody, anybody is interested uh, for the last minute, feel free to come. But, but let us know first so we know we can expect to. or you. catch us outside there and take a look at the agenda. There's lots of interesting stuff. Lots of people are already coming. How do you okay. add new hardware? I'm sorry? Um, uh, unfortunately, I can't attend because I'm in maintenance summit on one day and then I was hoping to do that. And I was going to ask you um, some of the things. K-self-test, I haven't seen that in your test suite. Yeah, K-self-tests yeah. are very complicated because the, the test needs to be ready for CI, which means it must give you a very clear pass-fail output. Right. And K-self-tests don't really have that. At least they didn't have it at the time when we looked at them. When was that? Uh, I'm not sure, but it was at okay. least a year ago. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at that because those tests are coming in from um, kernel developers. They're, they go in when features go in. So there are advantages to using it. So if you wanna collaborate to make Absolutely. them better, 
I am all for it, and yeah. I'll. So can, we'll can, just, can just hop in the in the. Yeah, we can we can talk offline. All, because uh, all absolutely right, the message. Yeah. There's the address. <laughs> so how do we add uh, new hardware? Let's say we want to add disk five. Uh, we go to the beaker administrators, and uh, the, the beaker system is organized like in labs, and these labs are spread all over the world. So there's somebody responsible for the lab. So you ask them like, okay, there's some hardware, can we add it to the lab? And they add it, and they uh, so is add it, it to a the different company from Red Hat. No, 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 no it's the same. It's, it's all internal. It's same. It's just different people maintaining different labs, uh, and they okay. add it, register the uh, the hardware there, and then. It pops up on the in their inventory, and we can target it. Uh, so I just wanted to say that there's a buff session starting in two minutes about upstream kernel CI projects in general. So if you can't attend the, the hack fest on Thursday and Friday, or even if you attend the hack fest <laughs> on Thursday and Friday, you can still go to the buff session to talk about general CI stuff. When is that? When, no. when in right now in the Amethyst Amethyst room? I think it's oh. two rooms there. Yeah. All right. I think uh, I think our time is up. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Nick. Thanks. Thank you.